What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content that I'm uploading onto my channel, then feel free to subscribe, and you can also offer suggestions on topics and characters and storylines and whatnot that we can have discussions on uh, later on in this channel. So I'm normally a huge fan of Greg Pak's writing style, and I don't mean to say that I don't like this, I mean, I, I very much am really enjoying Totally Awesome Hulk. It's a frat boy Hulk story, and it works out pretty cool, but um, in this story, Greg Pak kind of goes off the rails, and I'm not really sure what direction he was going in, but it's one of these instances where it's just, I couldn't help but cock my head to the side and say, Greg Pak, man, I'm not sure what you were wanting to do here, but something else I also want you guys to notice is I believe that here on my channel, this is the first time we're actually covering a story that has art by uh, Mike Del Mundo, and he's, he's a, a fabulous, you know, fabulous artist. He does an extremely good job, but I think his art in this story, or at least in the first issue of this story, really kind of takes Totally Awesome Hulk and brings it into his own, which I, I really like the way it looks. The unfortunate thing is he's only the artist for the first issue, and then for the next three, he, uh, it ends up being uh, Muhammad Ashtar, I think. Uh, but the fact remains that, there, remember, with Totally Awesome Hulk, his story's just kind of been isolated in a lot of different ways. It was really just sort of Greg Pak sitting down and saying, hey guys, here's where we reside, because by the time Civil War II kicked off, Totally Awesome Hulk was only eight issues in, so we weren't that far into the series and so at this point it's really just kind of us showing the fallout of, of Civil War 2. Now the death of Bruce Banner in the main Civil War 2 event uh, is actually pretty cool and it really really gives Greg Pak a chance to shine where he normally wouldn't and the reason why is because the Incredible Hulk predates Greg Pak by decades but Greg Pak is kind of the seminal writer. I mean we're learning about that right now as we're going through my Incredible Hulk videos. Greg Pak's kind of the guy that just reinvigorated interest in the Incredible Hulk. He's like the Jeff Johns for Bruce Banner and because of this he is a guy um, who, you know, was able to take this story of the death of Bruce Banner, mingle it with Amadeus Cho, a character that he created, and then show us some genuine, you know, response for Amadeus Cho. The reason why this works is because of the fact that, you know, this, this story initially picks up with Cho basically just in mourning. I mean, he's really just grieving. Now, his sister Maddie, again, is kind of the other half of this. I mean, Amadeus Cho is extremely intelligent. He's like the eighth smartest person on the planet, but uh, he's only able to do so much on his own, especially now that he's absorbed the Incredible Hulk persona out of Bruce Banner, which allowed him to become Hulk in the first place. And so Maddie's kind of like the brains behind the operation on the back end, where Amadeus Cho uses his intelligence to do what he needs to do. But again, he's really just kind of dealing with the fact that as one of his closest friends, Bruce Banner has died. Not only has he just died, he's basically been killed by Hawkeye, who was an Avenger. And so it's kind of a mishmash of feelings and emotions going on here. But in the midst of his grieving, he's suddenly met by the arrival of Carol Danvers. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I was going through Civil War II, I was like, man, I hate Carol Danvers. I don't like her anymore. That's kind of the problem with stories like Civil War II is because there's so much emotion involved and because we as people are usually irrational, it ends up putting us in a situation where we take a character that we would normally like and we're like, you know what? I don't like Carol Danvers anymore and we just won't read her stories anymore. <laughs> Granted, the stories are written pretty well. They're pretty entertaining. But uh, the cool thing about this is Greg Pak gives us as the reader exactly what we want. I mean, we have, you know, Carol Danvers showing up and saying, yeah, you know, she's got a huge host of soldiers and she's like, well, we're just checking on you. We know you are a friend of Bruce Banner. Uh, we just want to make sure that you're not going to go awry. I mean, in truth, this is Carol Danvers overstepping her bounds in the extreme, and Amadeus Cho recognizes this. I mean, he's going through, he's looking at these various guys, these various soldiers, he can tell their emotional state, he can tell that they're on the verge of sort of losing it, but Carol Danvers says, hey, look, you know, again, we just want to make sure that you're cool, we want to make sure that you're not going to pop off, and he says, look, I recognize what was going on. I understand that, you know, Clint Barton killed Bruce Banner because he felt like he had to. You know, I understand that in my head, but he says, in my gut, in my heart, I can't get over that because Bruce Banner was was a friend, you know, and so what he basically says is leave me alone. Let me mourn. Let me, let me cope with the loss of my best friend. Let me deal with that. And so Carol Danvers kind of offers some parting words and says, Hey, okay, you know, give me a shout if you need anything. But the real kicker to this is Amadeus Cho looks her square in the eye and says, Hey, I'm just kind of curious if I decided that I wanted to do something, if I wanted to turn into the Hulk and I wanted to take out Clip Barton, what makes you think you could stop me? And that is a legitimate question because Carol Danvers is strong, but she's not Hulk strong. I mean, she's not, she's nowhere near as strong as the Hulk is. And so if Amadeus Cho lashed out and reached like, you know, world breaker level strength, or even just below world breaker level strength, he would absolutely thrash Carol Danvers. And that was the big concern. I mean, that was, that, that's one of the reasons why, that's, that's really kind of the reason why Bruce Banner was killed in the first place. Because remember, Ulysses the Inhuman is the one that's basically giving off all these premonitions. He's the one that's going to all these individual characters in their solo series and saying, hey, here's a vision that I have of the future. And then the, the those individual characters react 
to it and that's how their stories tie into civil war ii it's a very loose tie-in but it's a tie-in nonetheless with carol danvers uh, she had basically you know been told of a vision where, where the incredible hulk was going to kill all of the superheroes and the idea was that everybody thought it was going to be bruce banner just because of the fact that bruce banner is synonymous with the hulk and everybody was under the suspicion that you know banner has just been human before and then become the hulk again i mean we just saw that with the end of uh, world war hulk so, so because of that people are like well i mean it may very well be a circumstance where banner becomes hulk and he lashes out now because of the fact that amadeus cho is so smart here he basically plays games with carol danvers one of the first things he does is turn into the hulk and take off to west virginia now of course we know that carol danvers would be monitoring him i mean that's kind of a given amadeus cho knows that and so he literally goes into the appalachian mountains you know he really just starts tearing things up you know starts smashing uh you know the, the big concern here is that he's near you know a mining area and there's a few thousand people that are you know relatively close and it's entirely possible that his rampage could result in those people dying but as carol danvers is watching the events unfold with a guy named jason a, a fellow shield agent uh, they come to the realization that what amadeus cho is doing is carving out letters in the dirt and it basically just says made you look <laughs> and so again it's amadeus cho messing with carol danvers saying hey i i can do whatever i want and you can't stop me you know and this is kind of cool because amadeus you know one thing to keep in mind as smart as he is as capable as he is he's a 19 year old kid now i don't know about you but when i was 19 years old if i had the powers of the hulk i'd, I'd just do whatever i wanted to i would just go and take stuff I'd, I'd just go smash things just because i could i mean i'd be i'd be a terrible like i'd be a bad guy i'd be a villain i'll be honest with you guys i would be a villain <laughs> that's exactly what i would be the first thing i would do is beat up all the people who gave me a hard time and then after that i would go and, and do stuff but the other cool thing is that while carol danvers is watching all this unfold jason and you know jason oh at least as he's revealed here we don't really know much about him uh but it's the idea that you know carol danvers says okay look we need to back off we need to give him his space because this is him sending us a message saying hey look i'm fine leave me alone and so carol's like okay let's go ahead and do that well then you know suddenly off panel we basically have black panther saying no no no, no. you leave him alone I'll I'll take it from here. Now, this is cool because uh, we basically get Black Panther's Hulk Buster armor, and it is badass. Also, you guys will notice this is basically where we switch over with a new artist, but I've never really known uh, Black Panther to have a Hulk Buster armor of his own, and it's cool. And the reason why is because Black Panther, as far as I'm aware, is smarter than Tony Stark. And because of this, he brings a whole new level of intelligence to the equation. And even if his intelligence is not as high as Tony Stark, Black Panther is a king, which means that he's used to approach Approaching situations with a different mindset than Tony Stark is. Tony Stark's reckless, he's rash, he kind of does what he wants to, he doesn't really worry about what anybody else thinks, but Black Panther loves the people that reside under him. They come first, and so he's used to putting other people before him and making sure that lives are saved as best they can, but he also kind of has to balance every single situation. Now, this becomes prevalent with the fact that when Carol Danvers says, hey, you can go on your mission, you can do whatever it is you want to do, you know, when it comes to basically uh, trying to reel in Amadeus Cho, but Jake O is going gonna go with you this this shield edge you know she's like he's gonna go with you on this mission now almost immediately after they take off black panther threatens to eject him <laughs> which is actually kind of funny like like you know jake's kind of giving this speech like hey man i've really read up on you and i, I love what you're about and the next thing he hears is passenger eject arms <laughs> which again this is just kind of greg pack throwing in a great little bit of, of of humor into the story greg pack's really really good about that greg pack's really good at giving us a story and injecting these small bits of humor and it's the small things like that which are why i really enjoy totally awesome hulk so much but you know jake basically says hey look man i'm i understand what it is that you're trying to do you know i'm not here to kill people i'm here to basically do this by the book you know i'm here to function adequately to do the job that i'm supposed to now you know what black panther says is hey look you know you may be talking about trying to balance the scales you may be talking about how we need to bring in amadeus cho all that kind of stuff but i'm a king i make decisions like this every day what hope could you possibly have to offer to a situation like this and jaco responds by saying i'm a guy that has to make choices on whether or not a person should die every day now it doesn't mean that he's the mastermind behind making this decision but what greg pack is basically telling us is it's one thing for some guy somewhere in a room to basically say, hey, that person over there needs to die. It's another for a person to pull the trigger. And so for Jake O, that presumably has killed people in the past, he has to weigh the ramifications of his actions. When he goes to pull the trigger and he goes to kill a guy, it's the exact same situation as Black Panther, as the king of Wakanda, you know, ordering his people or making a decision on what, what the best interest is of his people. Because Jake has to consider if this person dies, what's the fallout? Will there be other people that will come for Jake as the guy that pulled the trigger? Does this person that 
died? Do they have a family? How's their family going to be impacted? It's this human emotion. And that's really what Greg Pak is saying is that, yeah, you've got Black Panther as a king and you've got Jake as a, as a grunt that just follows order, but they're people. And they recognize that there are consequences for their actions. And T'Challa respects this, which is cool because T'Challa is the kind of guy where he's basically like, look, I don't want to go into a, go on a mission with a person that just does things. That's just a dog chasing cars to quote, you know, the Dark Knight. You know, he says, I want, I want a guy that thinks rationally, a guy that understands that there are consequences for their actions and that sometimes the best decision is to do nothing. And so because of that, because of the fact that Jake basically shows that he's got brains in this operation, you know, Black Panther basically keeps them on. Now at this point, they're really just kind of tracking uh, Amadeus Cho. But again, Amadeus Cho is one of the smartest people on the planet, is always aware of what's going on around him. He always knows what's happening around him. And because of this, he's well aware of the fact that Black Panther and Jake are watching him. And of course, he sends a couple messages to him, you know, basically saying bye, different things like that. But what this story does is it kind of shifts away from, from Black Panther and Jake to Amadeus and his sister Maddie. Because keep in mind, Maddie's kind of like the, the anchor that keeps him anchored to reality. She's the one that basically keeps him from just kind of losing his mind and going off. She's the, the voice of responsibility, so to speak. Because as smart as Amadeus Cho is, as great as he is, historically speaking, the way he's been written in Marvel Comics, he's just a kid that goes and does stuff. That's really it. He just goes and just tears things up and just kind of does whatever seems to be interesting at the time. He's got super bad ADD. <laughs> you know, but Maddie basically says, hey, look, there's monster sightings that are happening here. You have to go and take care of this. You've got to figure out what's going on with these monsters that are cropping up. Kind of a, a backdrop theme going on right now. You know, but he says, hey, look, I'm tracking Clint Barton. He's the only one that I care about right now. I don't care about what's going on in Texas. I'm not worried about some monster sighting out there in the country somewhere. You know, I'm going after what, you know, what Amadeus Cho considers to be a legitimate monster. And so what this does is this basically follows Cho to the cabin of uh, of Clint Barton. Now, it makes sense that this would happen I mean, just because of the fact that with Clint Barton having been the one to kill Bruce Banner, the biggest concern was that Amadeus Cho would go after him. And S.H.I.E.L.D., you know, just kind of took him up residence in a, in a cabin and said, hey, stay here because they assumed that it was extremely well hidden. But once Cho arrives, Clint Barton tries to talk him down. He basically tries to say, hey, look, man, you need to you need to relax. Like, I, I know you're mad. I know you're angry. You need to chill. And of course, you know, Amadeus Cho takes on his Hulk form. And basically, at least it seems like he's going to threaten Clint Barton. Now, this is where the ruse is revealed. And this is why Black Panther is so smart here. Black Panther basically reveals that he's Clint Barton. He was more or less wearing a hologram, a hologram disguise. And this is when he says, you're not thinking intelligently. Because he says, as smart as you are, Amadeus Cho, as, as intelligent as you are, you should have picked up right off the bat that I was Black Panther. If you were thinking intelligently, you wouldn't have fallen for my ruse as being Clint Barton. You would have known that I was Black Panther. And this is basically, you know, uh, Black Panther confronting Amadeus Cho with the fact that he's not thinking rationally, not as rationally as he believes he is, that his emotions are running wild. Now, the reason why this is very concerning here is because that was a hallmark of the Incredible Hulk. When it came to Bruce Banner Hulk, it was just anger. It was rage. It was wrath. It was death. That's all he was. He was just a force of nature that would just go through and just crush all opposition. And because of that, Black Panther is basically making the case that, yeah, you're super smart, but right now you're acting with emotion. You are Bruce Banner, Incredible Hulk. You're the Hulk that everybody's worried about. Now, of course, again, this, this really begs the question, this confrontation here between Black Panther and, and Amadeus Cho begs the question, is Black Panther preventing a scenario that was going to happen? Or is Black Panther creating a situation and then trying to stop it? That, that's one of the reasons why I like, you know, Greg Pak's writing, because it kind of leaves us with this question that we have to ask here. You know, if Black Panther had not put on his uh, his Hulkbuster armor, and if he had not attacked Amadeus Cho, would Amadeus Cho have, have attacked Black Panther? Would that have happened? Or would he have just left and then continued on the prowl for Clint Barton? That's a, a question that we don't have the answer to. That's not really given to us. Instead, Greg Pak kind of plays games and says, hey, look, maybe that would have happened. Maybe he would have left and gone after Clint Barton. Maybe he would have attacked Black Panther and killed him. But for whatever reason, which regardless of what situation would have taken place, Black Panther sits down and says, hey, look, if he decides to go after Clint Barton, I've got to stop him here and now. If he decides to attack me, of course, I definitely have to stop him here and now. And we basically learn that the overall plan of Black Panther is to basically siphon off the energy of Amadeus Cho, not to the point that uh, he loses his ability to become the Hulk. But because Black Panther is so smart, when he looked at Tony Stark's Hulkbuster armor, when it went against Bruce Banner, Tony Stark was thinking about it the wrong way. Tony Stark was, well, hey, let's just have a have armor that can go toe to toe in terms of physical strength against the Incredible Hulk. Whereas Black Panther said, I'll have a suit of armor that will basically
basically just absorb and magnify energy. And so what it'll do is basically the suit will become stronger. The angrier that Amadeus Cho gets, the stronger the suit of Black Panther becomes to the point that it can just overpower Amadeus Cho. Because keep in mind, with, with Cho's character, he's not like the traditional Banner Hulk. Banner Hulk had unlimited strength. Up to this point, the powers of Amadeus Cho are still being fleshed out. We don't know if he has unlimited strength. The indication is that he does not, but it doesn't mean that he won't at some future point in time. And that's what Greg Pak's kind of toying with here, simply because of the fact that in Austin, Texas, you know, switching over there for a second and picking up with Maddie, we again have this, these continued monster sightings and one actually crops up. Now, uh, this is where the story kind of goes off the rails a little bit. And so, so bear with me for a second. It's really just some young kid um, who's able to metamorph into a monster and then just feed off of people's emotions. And so as he feeds on their emotions, he becomes stronger and stronger. Now, this will serve more of like a moral purpose with regards to Amadeus Cho, more so than just him fighting some monster. But again, switching back over to Black Panther, the whole idea here is that, again, you know, with Greg Pak sitting down and saying, hey, we're still fleshing out the powers of Amadeus Cho, you know, as Maddie's contacting him and basically saying, hey, look, you know, here's everything that's going on. This monster's running amok, you know, it's going crazy. Black Panther's idea is to actually teleport Amadeus Cho to the negative zone, to basically transport him to another dimension. And so because of that, you know, while, while you know, Amadeus Cho is listening to Maddie panic, the screams in the background, this monster, you know, running amok, he basically reaches a new level of strength, you know, rips the arm off Black Panther's suit and just basically takes off. Now, this is why I say the powers are still being fleshed out because uh, it's even told to us, you know, when Jake O is going through and, and looking at the measurements, you know, looking at the brain waves and the, the biological signals and so on and so forth, Amadeus Cho, he basically says he's never experienced this level of power before. Amadeus Cho Hulk has never been this strong before. So again, it's Greg Pak continuing to expand his strength, continuing to build on his character's development. But at this point, the story kind of devolves down into this, this weird situation where it's just Amadeus Cho fighting a monster. In truth, I think it kind of begins to fall short, but I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll let you guys, uh, you know, tell me what it is that you think down here in the comments. But the idea is that, you know, switching over to Austin, uh, it's really just this monster showing the fact that it just feeds on people's emotions. It feeds on, you know, their anger, their wrath, their pride, their greed, you know, so on and so forth. And it makes it physically stronger. Now, of course, a lot of these emotions that it's feeling uh, are believed to be coming from Maddie, when in reality, they're coming from Amadeus Cho Hulk. And of course, this is really Amadeus Cho's, I guess, his stubbornness, his stubborn nature in the sense that he's basically, you know, constantly being told by Maddie, you have to control your emotions. This thing feeds on your emotions. You know, the angrier you get, the more proud you become, the more frustrated you become, the stronger this monster will become. But Amadeus Cho is not listening. Instead, Cho is looking at this thing as like a way to basically deal with his emotions in the sense that he has a lot of repressed guilt. He has a lot of repressed anger, a lot of repressed depression. A lot of these feelings that he's been feeling during the morning phase after the death of Bruce Banner, he hasn't been able to adequately let out yet. And so he's basically using this monster as a punching bag. The problem with this is that this monster punches back. And so because of that, Amadeus Cho is thinking irrationally. He's not thinking intelligently. He believes he has the upper hand. This monster reemerges and essentially seems to take him out and incapacitate him. And so because of that, it basically takes off with a baby. And this is really where Greg Pak starts talking about the realm of consequences, where he essentially has Maddie basically say, hey, look, you were told what was going on here. You were told that this monster feeds on people's emotions. You were told that it becomes stronger the more you let your emotions run wild, but you just weren't paying attention. You just weren't listening. You know, and so because of that, with Jake O and uh, Black Panther arriving on the scene and realizing that, you know, Amadeus was not going after Clint Barton and said he was going to, to Austin to stop this monster, they basically start working together again. You know, it's really kind of them coming together and realizing that they basically have to save this baby that was taken. Now, of course, Amadeus ends up, you know, jumping down into a crack in the ground alongside uh, Maddie. You know, Black Panther gives them a couple of orbs that help light the way and maintain communications. But in the end, uh, Amadeus, again, is continually stubborn here. He's continually refusing to basically listen to anybody around him in the sense that he more or less leaves Maddie hanging and he goes after this kid named Christian, who is essentially this monster. Now, Christian, as he's depicted here, is sadistic, is cruel, enjoys the idea of causing other people pain. And he says, look, I knew this was going to bring you out. You know, I wanted to feed on emotion. I wanted to see how strong I could get. The Incredible Hulk is the strongest there is. You were a friend of Bruce Banner. Bruce Banner was killed. I knew you were going to be full of emotion. I knew you were going to be full of, of, of so many different feelings that if I could draw you out and I could get you to fight me, I could feed on your emotions and just see how strong I could become. And then from there, just start attacking people with really no one standing in my way. Now, at this point, Amadeus Cho actually makes somewhat of a sacrifice. And in fact, what he really does is he sits down and says, I'm not going to control my emotions. And it's actually necessary to do that. When it comes to the character of the Incredible Hulk, the Incredible Hulk is, is not some being where you can just achieve higher levels of power, you know, higher levels of strength by being rational. Instead, the Incredible Hulk is very much an emotional character. I mean, if you look at the history of Hulk in Marvel Comics, all the high levels of strength the Hulk has achieved
Chief, World Breaker, and so on and so forth, have all been in a highly emotional state. The Incredible Hulk became World Breaker and showed up on Earth after his family was killed. At the end of, uh, of the World Breaker Hulk storyline, when Bruce Banner was, was believed to have lost his ability to transform into the Hulk and he uh, regained all that gamma radiation, you know, when the comic said he's returning back to the same Hulk that he was when he first showed up on Earth after Planet Hulk, he's going back to World Breaker Hulk. It's all been in an emotional state. Sometimes it was pride, sometimes it was love, sometimes it was anger, but it was always a highly charged emotional state. And because of that, it's really the situation where Amadeus Cho sits down and says, because of what I did before, because of the fact that I allowed my emotions to run rampant and this thing kept feeding on them, because of the fact that I can't beat it by thinking rationally, I have to let my emotions run awry. I have to let my emotions go crazy. Yes, it's going to feed on them and yes, it's going to get stronger, but I can't beat this thing with physical strength. Instead, we need a plan. And the plan is to use the plan of Black Panther to teleport Amadeus Cho to the negative zone and instead use it on this monster. And that's exactly what happens. This thing is basically whisked away and transported to another dimension. Now, of course, where the day is saved and we would expect things to kind of go back to normal, Greg Pak says, no, 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 Things aren't okay. Things aren't as great as you would like them to believe. Maddie is fed up with the fact that Amadeus Cho will not listen to people. She's fed up with the fact that he's stubborn, that he refuses to take advice, that he refuses to take any kind of criticism. He believes he's the smartest person in the world no one can tell him otherwise and she says i've had enough if you're going to keep being the hulk then you can be the hulk by yourself you can run that show by yourself now this is dangerous because of the fact that maddie is the one that keeps him grounded she keeps his head on straight and so sure in the moment when everything is calm when everything's chill yeah amadeus cho is a is a great guy and he's like hey everybody you know everything's everything's all copacetic uh but when it comes to some circumstance where his emotions just start running awry you know when he just starts, starts experience extreme rage extreme anger who's going to be there to reel him back into reality. And it's at that point that we're probably going to see the premonition of Ulysses coming true when he does attack all the superheroes and he does kill all the superheroes. But the way that Greg Pak wraps this story up is actually pretty powerful and it's pretty emotional in the sense that we have Amadeus Cho uh, basically travel to uh, to a diner that the actual Clint Barton is at in Topeka, Kansas. And he sits down with him and he says, hey man, I came here to kill you. And I know for a fact that S.H.I.E.L.D., Black Panther, Carol Danvers, Alpha Flight, the Ultimates themselves, you know, probably not even Thanos could stop me. And so he says, if I wanted to kill you, I would kill you. You would be dead. But he really just kind of breaks down and he says, I don't want to kill you. The one thing I want more than anything else, the one thing I want more than to kill you, the one thing that I want more than to, to drag Carol Danvers, you know, through a desert tied by your feet is to have my friend back. That's the one thing I want. And that's this 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 moment right here is why I love Greg Pak writing because it's just pure unadulterated emotion. It's just two guys grieving over the loss of their friend because it's very easy for us as the reader to say, yeah, man, Clint Barton killed Bruce Banner. What a dick, you know, but you got to remember Bruce Banner and Clint Barton fought side by side for a long time. You know, even then Clint Barton's character was just a victim of circumstance when he first showed up. He was just kind of thrust into the role of being a villain. He was basically manipulated by Black Widow, if I remember correctly. And then eventually he became a good guy. The whole gist of this was that he spent his entire life trying to make up for a handful of misdeeds that were taken out of context. And so he was always trying to be the good guy. He was always trying to be the hero. And all it took was him killing a well-known character, a well-known being in the Marvel Universe for it to all come crashing down, despite the fact that he was asked by Bruce Banner to do it. And so again, it's just, you know, it's just raw emotion here. It's just two people grieving over the loss of their friend and coming to terms with the fact that they're both in the same boat, that they're both emotional, that they both want Bruce Banner to come back. But if you guys are new here to Comics Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like. And uh, yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace.